Well, the Lord be with you. If you would turn with me, if you haven't already, to Acts chapter 23. We're going to be looking at the entire chapter this morning. And if you do remember last time, we uh, saw the Apostle Paul has finally ended his third missionary journey, and he arrived in the city of Jerusalem, which if you will recall, um, this has been a long um, journey, a, a long plan where Paul had been purposing in his spirit to get there, and along the way, he just kept hearing these warnings that, Paul, if you go there, something bad's going to happen. Paul, we're, we're concerned about you. Please don't go to Jerusalem. And we saw last week, Paul, when he got to Jerusalem, he he did see that he was going to experience some, some trials and tribulations where we see that um, he goes and he gives a benevolence gift to the church of Jerusalem there. He meets with James and some of the other elders, um, and then he uh, tells them the good report of what has happened with all the Gentiles coming to the faith, receiving the gospel. But while he was there, the, uh, the elders and, and James, they told Paul that there's a problem that many uh, in Jerusalem are concerned with his ministry because they had been misinformed. They had misunderstood his ministry and they thought he was teaching them to reject the law or to forsake Moses or to um, re renounce his Judaism. And so many thought that basically Paul was anti-Jew. And so because they were concerned that this may um, affect some of the new converts that were coming from the Jewish faith to um, recognize Christ as their Messiah, they, they decided that he needed to go to the temple and, and help some men with a vow to, um, to reaffirm that he is um, for the law and that he supports um, Jews practicing these customs. And as he went there, we see that um, some of the Jews from Asia that in Ephesus that hated Paul, they were also there, and so what they ended up doing is they cause um, a ruckus, they cause um, a division, and, and basically stir up the crowd and saying, hey, Paul is here, he's against the Jews, he brought a Gentile into the temple, which would have been a, a big no-no uh, for the Jews to do, and um, basically what happens is the, the crowd grabs him, drags him out of the temple, starts to beat him, isolating him, and trying to kill him. Well, at that point, there's this um, commander who hears about what's going on at the temple, and he goes and he gets Paul trying to figure out what's going on, and he ends up taking him away from the crowd because he was fearful that they might kill him. And so as he was going to take him, he was going to flog him or scourge him, like would have been like whipping him. And uh, they wanted to get the information out of Paul of what was going on. And uh, whenever he was about to do that, Paul lets him know that he actually has Roman citizenship, which that means that he's not allowed legally to punish him in this way to get the information out of him. So he couldn't interrogate him. And so what he decided to do is like, well, fine, if we can't do this, I'm going to find out and get to the bottom of this, and we're going to take you to the Sanhedrin. And so that's where we actually find Paul today after he's been beaten, attacked at the temple, and now he's been interrogated, he's been questioned by the commander, uh, and now he's being taken to the Sanhedrin in chapter 23. And so as we see here, Paul, in verse 1, it says that he, as he arrives there, it says he looks earnestly at the council. So he's looking at the Sanhedrin. And now if you don't know much about the Sanhedrin, it would have been like the supreme Jewish council of the day. They would have been responsible for basically all of the, um, the legal activity regarding religion and politics for their um, region of Judea, right? So um, under Rome, obviously, but ultimately they were given some free reign to rule um, as this uh, supreme Jewish council. And the council made up of, was made up of around 71 members. So you would have had 70 um, Jewish um, priests, religious leaders, and this would have been probably made up of both the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and then you would have one high priest. And the high priest at this time where Paul is, is, um, is encountering them, his name is Ananias. And Ananias, um, don't be confused with Ananias earlier in the book, who would have been a Christian and who um, was the one that met Paul around his conversion experience. Don't get him confused with him. Or Annas, who was someone else who was a religious leader who persecuted the church. So this is a different individual. And Ananias is the high priest of the Sanhedrin at this time. And he was actually known for his corruption and um, his, um, his violence and hostility towards um, prisoners, and, and we see that he lives up to that reputation in this chapter. So Paul, as he, he's looking earnestly at this council of 71 Jewish men coming to judge him and question him, it says that he looks at them, and what he boldly proclaims, he says, men, or he says, men and brethren, 
He says, I've lived before God my whole life with a good conscience. Basically, he's saying that I'm not guilty. I, I've been living un, before God, trying to serve him as faithfully as I know how, essentially. And as soon as Ananias, the, the high priest, he hears this, he immediately commands some of the men that are closest to him to strike him or to slap him across the face. And so it seems that as if these men oblige and listen to him. And then as soon as that happens, it seems like Paul has some um, righteous indignation here. And he basically says, um, you strike me, I'm, God's going to strike you. And then he says that you are a, a whitewashed wall. And uh, that might sound similar to something you may be familiar with when Jesus was encountering some religious leaders that were hypocrites because he called them whitewashed tombs, right? And so what that phrase essentially means is that to be whitewashed is like to be painted over, right? To, to cover up the imperfections. So if you had a, a whitewashed tomb, that would mean that you, you're making it really pretty on the outside where you don't see all the, the imperfections and you don't recognize that there's a lot of dead bodies on the inside. That's what Jesus was saying that the relig religious leaders were like. They're like really pretty on the outside, but they're dead inside. Well, likewise, Paul here is saying to the high priest that he's saying, you're a whitewashed wall. So maybe a wall that had lots of holes or, or dirt or um, it was deteriorating maybe. And now he's covered it up and he looks really, really nice formally and religiously, but he also is corrupt. So he's calling him a, a hypocrite like Jesus did with the religious leaders. Now what's interesting here though, after he says this, is that some of the other members on the Sanhedrin council, they, they're actually, um, they get really offended and they're like, are you going to revile or curse God's high priest? Because he was the high priest. And, and Paul actually, it seems that he didn't know that he was the high priest. And he actually, it almost is, it's odd. It, it's kind of weird trying to figure out exactly what, what Paul is thinking here. But he actually then says, like, brethren, I wasn't aware that he was the high priest. And he, Paul even quotes a scripture that says that he's not supposed to revile or, or to curse God's high priest. So some are wondering, well, why would Paul not know that? You know, why would he not be aware of this? And, and, and so was Paul wrong here, or is he, um, you know, what's going on? Well, so some think that maybe because of Paul's thorn in the flesh, some scholars think that Paul had some poor eyesight. And so some think that, well, maybe it's possible that with Paul's poor eyesight, that maybe he actually couldn't see who made the command to have him um, struck. So that's one potential. Some others think, well, maybe he was actually being um, more sarcastic when he said this. He wasn't saying, I didn't know he was the high priest, or the, yeah, the high priest. Rather, he's thinking, well, the way that he's acting, I wouldn't even know he's the high priest. Um, I personally maybe take the third option because it seems as if he seems to be somewhat genuine here as he says, brethren, and he even quotes a scripture supporting what they're upset about. Um, and I think that what, what he's actually saying here is that he's been gone for years. And the one who held the position of the high priest actually switched a lot of the time. And it's likely that based on this impromptu call meeting by the commander, um, they probably didn't have all of their um, regular um, attire and garments on, the, the ceremonial garments that he would have had that would have distinguished him as the high priest. So it's very possible that Paul um, didn't know it, but what he was doing is he was expressing his, his um, righteous ind indignation for the man because he was actually breaking the law because Jewish law says you cannot punish an innocent person. And they hadn't found him guilty yet, and they're already slapping and striking him. And so what we're seeing is Paul was really upset and mad. I think righteously, we all probably wouldn't have even handled it as good as Paul, right? If someone slaps you across the face, you might just not say something. You might actually lash out and try to, to fight him, right? Well, he just basically says, you know, basically God's going to get, get you for what you're doing here and justly, um, and you're basically being a hypocrite just like Jesus said. But as he does recognize him as the high priest, it seems that though he didn't respect the man, he did once again respect the office, and I think that once again reminds us, for those who are in authority over us, we are to give them the proper respect. And it seems like Paul doesn't seem to press the issue anymore. So he, he moves on from there, and actually we see him shift his um, strategy in this discussion because he moves from the, the personal approach, right, where he's trying to explain, hey, I've been living with a good conscience before God. Um, I'm trying to be faithful here. And then he goes to from the, the personal to the, the doctrinal side. And he, he tries another way, and he tries to bring this theological discussion out. And he says, the reason that I'm being um, tried here, the reason I'm even being questioned, is because I believe 
in the resurrection of the dead. I believe in this hope that there is a future resurrection. And he's saying that, and I'm a Pharisee, a Pharisee that was born of a Pharisee. So his father um, was a Pharisee. And so what he's actually doing, he's actually being um, very wise here, very clever, because as he's saying this, it says that he perceived that the group was mixed of Pharisees and Sadducees. So what he actually was doing was he was telling the truth and saying why he was being brought up on charges because of his belief in the resurrection of Christ and the, and the hope of the future resurrection. But what he does is he, he perceives that there's some division within this group. And so what he does is he brings this up because he knows that the Pharisees, well, one, they're going to say, oh, he's a Pharisee. Yeah, he's like us. And they may have probably been the minority group within this larger body. So they could have maybe felt frustrated sometimes with the, um, the politics and, and things of the Sadducees. So he's saying, I'm a Pharisee. I was born of a Pharisee. And I believe in the resurrection, which also the Pharisees would be like, yeah, we believe in the resurrection too. But the issue is the Sadducees, they didn't. See, the Sadducees, they were kind of like the, the theological liberals of the day. And I don't mean in like a political, like Republican, you know, liberal, Democrat thing like that. It's a, a theological liberals of the day where they were rationalists. They didn't really believe in any of the supernatural stuff. They basically kind of did away with all of that. So when it came to like the resurrection from the dead, didn't believe that. They didn't believe in, in angels uh, or, or demons or spirits. They, they rejected all that. In fact, they didn't even believe in majority of the Old Testament. So at this time, all they would affirm were the first five books of the Bible, so right, the, the Pentateuch. They would have affirmed that, but basically everything else they, they rejected. So Paul, being clever here and wise, he, he says, this is the, the issue here. This is why. And so the Pharisees would have ran to his defense because they're like, wait, if he's being charged on what we support, we shouldn't be punishing him. And so it says that there becomes this huge division, um, huge arguments going on. And it says it gets so fierce that it says that the mob of the Sanhedrin now debating amongst themselves are about to tear Paul apart into pieces. So the commander, probably frustrated because he's been trying. First, he tried to find out and let Paul preach in front of the crowd in, in uh, the temple. Didn't get his answers. Then he was going to go flog him. Didn't get the answers. Now he's taking him before the Sanhedrin. Still not getting the right answers. And so now he, what he does is he takes Paul away and he puts him in the barracks. And so Paul is in the barracks for about a day. And while Paul is there, and this would have been like the, probably the prison area for him, he's in the barracks. And it says that while he's there, it says that he receives another vision of the Lord. Now, this is probably the third vision uh, or encounter that Paul has had with Christ since he's been commissioned. At least it's recorded in the book of Acts. And it says that in this text, it says that Jesus, or the Lord, on the following night, stood by him and then said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So Jesus actually comes to the barracks where Paul is at after he's been interrogated, beaten, all of these different things, and he tells him basically to take courage, to be of good courage, um, to, to take heart, and he says that basically there's going to be more for you to do. Just like you've been testifying of me being a witness here in Jerusalem, you're also going to get to Rome. You're going to be able to do the same thing in Rome. And while Jesus is telling Paul about this encounter, it says that the, some of these religious leaders that have been a part of the council, they are actually conspiring around this time, and they're actually having this great plot. And what they're going to do is they've planned that they're going to call Paul back to the Sanhedrin council and say that they want to interrogate him some more. They want to get some more information out of him. But really what they're going to do is have a group waiting for him, and they're going to kill him before he even gets there. So the goal is they're saying we, we have, we're going to set up this ruse, we're going to get Paul to come back to the council, and we're going to kill him. And it's interesting, it says right around the time of you know, Paul hearing this from Jesus and this group starting to plot against him, it says that Paul's sister's son hears about it. Now, if you're thinking like, as to me, you're like, well, wait, who's Paul's sister? And who is Paul's sister's son? Because we've never heard about them before. And in fact, this is really the only information we get about them. And in fact, we actually really don't know much about Paul's um, family life um, other than the few things that we get glimpses of here, really. And so it doesn't explain how he heard because also he's hearing this private plot of these Jewish religious leaders. So the best guess that I have is that like Paul and his father who became Pharisees, this, uh, his nephew was probably in this region, probably trying to study to be a Pharisee since it was in his family line and 
presumably maybe his sister um, ha- had resided there, and so somehow he's around the same circles, and maybe they didn't know the family connection. So, but anyway, Paul's nephew, he hears about this plot, and what he does is he goes um, to Paul and explains it, and Paul tells him, you need to go get the centurion, and we need to make sure that this gets um, known to the commander, and so all of this plays out, and so the commander, which we actually see his name is mentioned here in this chapter, Claudius Lysias, so this is the same commander from earlier, and it says that the commander hears this, and he says, okay, well, we need to get him out of here, and so then what happens is um, Claudius, he takes Paul, gets 400 70 soldiers to guard him and then takes him all the way to Caesarea where he's going to be with Felix and Felix is the governor of Judea um, so the procur- uh, pu- procurator um, also think of Pontius Pilate it's the same office so this is a man who has succeeded him so Pontius Pilate already served whenever Jesus was around whenever he was crucified well now Felix is there and he's holding that same office and so they bring him to Felix, and, and there's also this letter that Claudius wrote to him explaining the details of why he's sending him there, that there was this secret plot to kill him, and it's interesting in the letter, by the way, he doesn't even mention about the part where we almost flogged him, or we, we were getting ready to interrogate him. He, he, he makes it really, really look nice, like we, we saved him, and we wanted to protect him, right? So he makes it look really, really good for him. And so he gives him to, to Felix, Felix receives him, he says, I'll hear your case, but I need to have the witnesses come first. And so he says, the Sanhedrin needs to be here, um, and so he, they're going to wait, and so what they do is they have Paul being held at Herod's Praetorium, or, or Herod's Palace. So, so that's kind of where we see the end of chapter 23, where Paul now um, is in the hands of Felix, the governor of Judea, in Herod's Praetorium. So as we think about this chapter, and we think about all of these different interactions that Paul is having here, I think that the, the first thing that I want to draw your attention to as I think we hear this reminder that we are to live before God with a good conscience. We are to live before God with a good conscience. In verse 1, as I said, Paul claims here a, a good or a clear conscience before God. It's interesting, the word conscience that he uses here, it's actually probably one of Paul's favorite words because he used it here and he also uses it again In Acts 24, so a chapter later in verse 16, and he says this, This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. I think that is a great way to look at our um, purpose and goal in life, is to not have a conscience with offense towards both God and and men. We should seek and strive to have a clear or a good conscience. And, and we actually, we see that there are 21 other times in Paul's letters that he actually mentions this um, topic on the conscience. So think about that. 21 times in all of his letters, plus these couple of other times we see in Acts here talking about this was his goal in life, was to have a clear, a good conscience before men. Now, I think it is important, though, that we we see that Paul, what he's saying here, as he says, I've lived before God with a good conscience, he's not saying I'm morally perfect, right? He he trusted in in the sufficiency and the atoning work of Christ. He didn't think he was the Savior. I think rather what he was um, affirming here is he says, based on his fallen ability, he did his very best to serve the Lord as best as he knew how. And if he did make a mistake when he did sin, he would repent of it and he would trust in the sufficiency of Christ. I think that's what he's saying there. He's not saying that he's perfect. He's saying, I've done everything I can, my best way how to serve and honor the Lord. And there's nothing that I'm aware of that I have not um, reconciled or, or repented of at this point. And I think that, um, it's interesting that Paul would say this, and I think it's, um, should be encouraging because Paul, if this is true, which I believe he's being sincere here, Paul maintained a clear conscience considering all of these social and cultural, political, and spiritual pressures that he had. Think about that. All of these different pressures that he was regularly having as he would go into different cultures, different religions, um, different politics of the day, and all of these things that were regularly, you know, crashing in on him, and it says that throughout all of this, he's able to maintain a clear conscience. So that means it can be done. That means that you can actually go through and experience a lot of the things that are going on in our world, and you can actually live before God with a good 
conscience. But I think it also implies something here. It's that you have a conscience. God has created you with a conscience. You were made in the image of God, and it says that with the image of God, we have certain faculties, certain things that remind us of God. And actually, there are certain things that throughout God's creation that he has revealed his invisible attributes to us. And I think our conscience is actually one of those things. But when I charge us with living before God with a good conscience, it's important that we remember that there is also a way to have a bad conscience. Just having a conscience doesn't necessarily mean you have a a good conscience. But what exactly is a conscience? Well, I think we are somewhat reminded or taught of this in Romans 2.15. It says this, Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. I think what Paul is getting at is what the conscience is. It's our inner witness. It's something God has designed in us where we have an inner witness. It's that inner conversation, that inner monologue that you're having with yourself about your life, about your actions. And and what the inner witness, what your conscience does is it evaluates all of our actions. And what it does is it will encourage us when we are doing the right things. And it's going to convict us when we're doing the wrong things. So a helpful way, maybe you've heard of this before, it's kind of like, it's like your moral compass, right? It's pointing you and letting you know what direction you're heading. But it's important that as we talk about the conscience, we're not saying that it sets the standard. It's not setting what is right. It's only applying it, right? So if you were to think of a compass, right, it's not north, but it will let you know where north is, right? So that's the difference. You have to make sure that your conscience It's not the standard, rather it's applying what the standard is, and you need to ensure that it's doing it correctly, right, that that we're doing it right. In fact, we should be careful and we should also um, be mindful of our, our, our conscience because in Romans 14, 23, Paul even says that anything that we do that is apart from faith, it in itself is sin, So we need to be careful that we pay attention to what our conscience is saying, right? So if you're in the wilderness trying to travel, and you know you have to go north, but your conscience keeps telling you, hey, you're going south, you need to probably pay attention to what's going on there, right? You need to be alert to what's happening, because otherwise, even the things, even if we don't do them, or or, or even if um, they're not necessarily wrong in themselves, but if we, we, we perform them and we don't have faith, it's actually an action of sin. We're violating our conscience. So we need to be very aware of what our conscience is saying. Another way to think of it is not only a compass that guides, another way I think that could be helpful is to think of our conscience as like a, a window, right? Think of like a window to a house or to a car, right? See, what happens is the window allows you to see through it, and it allows light to be brought back in to the car or to to the home, right? And I think likewise, our conscience can allow God's light or God's revelation to enter us. It allows us to filter in that light and to receive it, and then we can, like I said, apply it. But I think it's important that as we think about these um, analogies of the compass or or we think about um, a window, right, that receives light, we need to make sure that as we think about these things, we are checking and caring for our conscience, See, just like a compass, it can break. Sometimes, you maybe have seen a compass before where it always tells you north, 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 north. You know, that's not a very good compass, right? That's not a very reliable compass. Or maybe you've experienced this before. Have you ever um, been driving down the highway and your, your windshield is just covered with mud or dirt or water or combination of you don't even know what it is on your, on your windshield. You just can't see, right? Or maybe you're like me and you ever have those bad mornings where you forget to put your, your frost guard on your windshield and then you get up in the morning, you're in a hurry to get somewhere and it's completely covered in ice. And so now what you're doing is you're trying to chisel away and then it's not working because it's so thick and then you're like trying to crank the heat all on the windshield and you're like, well, now I have this little piece I can see. Can I get out and drive and try to go this way and not kill anybody, right? And you're, I think that's what our conscience can actually be like sometimes. It's like where you're barely seeing anything. You have all of this dirt or all of this ice that you've accumulated because you haven't been paying attention. 
See, I think Paul is someone who paid attention. He was ensuring that he was chipping away the ice, chipping and cleaning the dirt off of his conscience regularly so that he could say to God, God, I've been living before you with a good conscience. In fact, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 2, listen to the way that Paul describes a a bad conscience. Um, listen, Listen to these words. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So the way that he's describing some that have allowed false doctrine or, or the, the, the cares of the world to, um, to entrap them, it says that they've actually allowed their conscience to be like seared by a hot iron. That is, it would be cauterized. Right, so like to be burnt or scorched. He's saying that you that their um that their conscience has basically been deadened. It's it's become calloused or corrupted because of their repetitive sin. And I think that's important that we would remember that if you keep living and pressing on in sin and aren't turning from it, you're going to find yourself with a dead co- uh, conscience, a calloused conscience, one that has been seared by a hot iron. And I'm sure that many of you probably either have experienced this at some point in your life or you know someone that has, right? Here's the thing. What happens when you start missing church? At first, it's, you know, you feel bad about it, right? You're like, oh, I shouldn't have been there. I should have been there. Oh, I really hate missing. But as you notice, the more you miss church, the less you miss church, right? You stop feeling guilty at some point as you slowly make it less and less of a priority. Or same thing with scripture reading, right? Or maybe it's just some sin in your life, right? Maybe you're just, you know, and I think in our day and age, especially when it comes to media, the things that we watch, the things that we listen to, there are so many things that we are regularly filtering in that our conscience has really become numb. It's not being shocked by all of the nudity on the screen. I've talked to some believers that they recommend a movie or a show to me, and I'm like, oh, is it good? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's great. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm really interested in it. And then I'll ask, like, does it have, like, anything that I need to be aware of, like, nudity or, or a lot of excessive language or violence or anything like that? Do I need to be aware? And they're like, no, it's actually pretty clean. And I'm like, oh, awesome. So I'm fine, because it's hard to find some good shows sometimes. Maybe you can relate to this. And so I'm, like, really excited. Me and my wife will sit down, and we'll be watching the first episode, and literally it's like a porno. Or it's like, you know, literally F word, the Lord's name in vain, left and right. And there are things, that there are Christians regularly in, in engaging all of this and thinking, what's the problem? It's because your conscience has become deadened. Is there something like that in your life that you're not seeing it for what it really is? Because you're not taking care of your conscience. You've got to cherish and protect your conscience. Clean it up. And I think the way that we do that is a good conscience is always informed by Scripture. It says that the Word of God actually washes us. I think that a good conscience is regularly engaging the Word of God, testing it to the things of our culture, testing it to the things that we're doing, so that way we are seeing the good things and we're being encouraged by them. Right? A good conscience will encourage you when you're living righteously, but you'll also feel convicted. Have you ever felt convicted recently? Here's the thing. If you're not ever feeling convicted, you probably also have a conscience that's not doing its job right? Just like, a, like I said, that compass, right? That compass, it needs to tell you when you're going not north anymore, right? It needs to let you know, right? So a good conscience is doing both of these things. It's encouraging us and it's convicting us. And I think, once again, we yield to the Spirit. And one of the best ways that we can keep our conscience clean is by in- informing it with Scripture. And I think that Paul lives as a great example for us to, to see how that um, can be played out. The next thing that I want to draw your attention to is I think in verse 6 that we are reminded that we are to perceive with precision. What that means is we are to be aware of things, to, to notice things and look at them and see them accurately. Because in this text, it's, we see that Paul, as he was observing and perceiving, it says in the text, he perceived that there were these Pharisees and these Sadducees and he knew his audience well. He was wise enough to perceive what was going on uh, amongst themselves as, as in social interactions as well as doctrinal level. And he said, I understand what's going on and I'm going to use that to my advantage. And so what he does is he actually divides and conquers. That's what Christians can do when we actually are doing what he did in, in the first point where he's informing himself 
with Scripture, right? He's informing his conscience. He's also living a life where he is intentional with those he encounters and interacts with. He's, he's learning what the culture and the, what the worldviews are of the day so that he can compare them to the, the truth of, of the Bible. And so we see him doing this, and then as he, he perceives these things, he then is very precise with his words. He, he perceives it, and then he pursues it. And I think that it's important that Christians hear this, and I won't spend a lot of time on this point, but Christians, I think, can sometimes be oblivious. You know, we don't have a lot of wisdom sometimes. And I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to anyone else here. But you probably have been around this sometimes, and it could even be in a church building, or it could be someone in leadership, and you'll just hear some of the things that they say. They didn't think very much about what they were, what they were saying. They just said what came to their mind, right? Or they didn't think about who was around, Maybe they made a joke, and it was about something that probably shouldn't have been joked about anyway, but especially shouldn't have been joked about whenever this person who was literally struggling with that very issue was just right there. I was actually thinking, I think um, this morning we, we, we um, talked about hell briefly, and I thought to myself as I was, as I was hearing the message, I'm like, you know what? Sometimes I hear, myself included, Christians, where we make a joke about, you're going to hell. Maybe you've probably heard that before, like, oh, we did this, we're going to hell. Think about what that sounds like if you're someone that's lost and hears that. Is hell a serious issue? But we joke about it. We're oblivious sometimes. We aren't perceiving what we're saying, how we're acting, how we're reacting. Right? We have to think about who we're around and what we are doing. We have to be so much more intentional. So we need to walk in wisdom. And I think it's important that, because some people will be like, well, we, we should just trust God for his providence, right? I mean, God's going to take care of it. We don't need to be so overly concerned about what we say and when we say it and who we're saying it to. Well, I think it's important that we remember, yes, we are to trust in God's providence, but we are also to walk in wisdom. It's not a one or the other, it's both and. See, Paul trusted that God was going to do what he needed to do, but he also was very intentional with using his wisdom, figuring out how does God want me to interact with these people? How am I to respond to the situation? And as we see, it worked out really, really good when he did that. That's why Proverbs 4, 7, it says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom and all you're getting, get understanding. See, this is a call for us to regularly seek wisdom and recognize wisdom is the principal thing. It's one of the most important things, right? It says that Jesus, he grew in wisdom, right? We are to grow in wisdom. In fact, Jesus also told his disciples that we are to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And I think, once again, that's what you see Paul doing. He was harmless. He was getting struck. He wasn't fighting anybody. He was imprisoned, interrogated, but he was wise. And he would use his wisdom at the right time, at the right place, for the right reason. And so I think we need to also see Paul as a good example for us to perceive with precision. And the final thing that I think we see in verse 11 is we are reminded to take courage in Christ. I love in verse 11 how it explains that Jesus stood by Paul and then gave him this encouragement, this encouraging word. Think about this. Jesus, the risen Christ, the one who was dead and is now alive, came to the barracks where Paul was at. And he, and he actually is standing there before him. And then he speaks to him and he gives him this, this statement. He says, to be of good cheer. And that, that word, be, or those, that phrase, be of good cheer, it's actually only one word in the Greek and it's uh, tharseo. And what Tharseo simply means is, it could mean to, to be of good courage, but it also, or, or be of good cheer, but it also could mean to take courage, or to take heart, or, or be confident. See, this word is only used five times in the New Testament. And what I think is so profound about this word is that it's used five times, but every time it, that it is used, it's used by Jesus. Every single time that Jesus uses this word. He told the woman who had the, the blood issue, the hemorrhage, he says, daughter, Tharseo, be of good courage. Be of good cheer. He said to the man who was lame, he says, your sins are forgiven, Tharseo. Take heart, take courage, be confident. When the disciples were on the raging waves and the storm, and Jesus is walking on the water, he says, for sale. He says, take courage, because Christ was right there. I think it's a, a helpful reminder for us 
that when we have Jesus, we can take courage in every circumstance. Because John 16, 33, we see him say this again. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Tharseo, I have overcome the world. That is why we can take courage. Because there is not one thing that you will face on this side of eternity that Christ has not already won the victory. There's not anything that we will encounter or experience that Christ hasn't already said, I overcame it. We take courage and comfort in Christ because He is our champion. He is our victor. And He has already declared it to His disciples 2,000 years ago. And so that means that when we look to Jesus, we will find our strength and our courage. We find our strength and our courage when we look to Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2-3, to it says, Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against him, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So what he's saying is, he says, look to Jesus so that you will not be discouraged, that you will not become weary, that we understand what he did on the cross and we know that he didn't stay there Rather, that he is at the right hand of God the Father. When you look to Jesus, it puts everything else into perspective. And I think Paul could have easily been discouraged here, right? He just had a sermon that didn't go very well in Jerusalem. I know that there's times where I've had a sermon that didn't go the way I had hoped, right? You don't always feel the best, but literally everyone attacked him after he preached, Or they sought to attack him and kill him after he preached. So that could have been discouraging. He's been imprisoned. That could have been discouraging. He's been interrogated. He's been slapped. That could have been discouraging. But with all of that, Jesus was enough. He could be encouraged. He could have strength because Jesus was sitting with him or standing with him in the barracks. Say, I would rather be in prison with Jesus than in heaven without him. If you're going through something right now, if you're experiencing that moment where you're in the barracks, Jesus can be with you. There are sometimes that I've had some really, really bad days, and I'll just go to my, my solitary place where I'm going to be with the Lord, and I can tell you there are moments that I know for a fact He was there with me, standing there. And I didn't hear an audible voice, I didn't see Him, but I knew that He was there. And you can have those moments as well. One other thing I want to say on this is that I think that it's interesting that we're talking about courage in Christ, right? But I think that fear is actually our source of courage. And it might be a weird way to think about it, but actually the fear of the Lord is the source of true courage. In Luke 12, 4-5, Jesus says this, And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear, Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. See, when you recognize who God is, when you recognize who Jesus Christ is, the Lord of heaven and earth, and whenever you have the proper reverence and fear of who he is, who are you going to fear on the earth? What can man do to you? Sometimes we as Christians, we get so caught up with the fear of man so we don't do certain things, we won't share the gospel here, we won't pray in public, we, 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 we won't we'll compromise on certain issues. When you fear the Lord, and you recognize Him compared to anybody else, when you recognize He's the one that overcame the world, when you have that proper fear of the Lord, you'll find true courage. And that's what Paul, I think, finds as, as Christ regularly gives him this reminder. And as he was departing with his words to Paul, he says, and you're going to continue on to Rome. And that would have been such good words of encouragement, I think, for Paul. A faithful servant that hears you have more work to do would excite them. Now, if you're a lazy servant and and God's saying, I have more work for you to do, you might not be very happy about that. But for Paul, that was another word of encouragement. You're going to Rome. And so that's what we see happening the rest of this chapter as he goes to Felix. He's on 
the way to Rome. Christ is in control. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. I thank you for the body of Christ that is here, committed to fellowshipping with one another and and worshiping you and serving you in spirit and truth. I pray that we would hear this message today, that we would be encouraged to live before you with a good conscience, that we would perceive with precision and, 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 and seek after wisdom, but ultimately that we would take courage in Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we would remember that he overcame the world by living a perfect life, dying on the cross for the sins of the world and rising from the dead, and that he now is beside you at the throne, that we would have courage, that we would have confidence, and that we would know that you are with us, and in all things, that is enough. Lord, we love you. We thank you. I pray that we would apply this message to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.